And Beatrice, what, 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 what do you make of the talk that we need to have all sides in Parliament united, even the speaker in the middle at the end of the day, following the Supreme Court ruling? Okay, so Roland, good morning, morning. to you and our cherished viewers. This morning, I don't normally do this, but I want to do it. I want to say a very good morning to Madame Lodina Mahama. What did she do? I think that she's proving that you can still be a woman. You can still have a foundation on your face, have a foundation and also transform the lives of other women. Over the last years, I've seen how passionate she's been about women and mortality issues about women who want to birth another life. And so just two days ago, in Atebubu and in Bodom, she commissioned a maternity blog for the communities. Before mm. that, she had done that in Bali, and she went to Ketu North to donate medical supply, and then to Tamale North to donate medical supply. I think she's so passionate about the health of women. And I, I am also very passionate because, but for the fact that I had my first baby in a private hospital, I would have lost my life. And so I could see death practically staring me. And so I appreciate it when women go and give birth and then we create that conducive environment for them to come back because I don't think that any woman deserves to lose her life merely because she wanted to give life to another person. And I think that on behalf of the many women and the children whose lives she'll be saving by these generous acts, we want to say that we salute her. Many people have resources. They choose to buy expensive bags. They choose to fly presidential private jets. And she having her own personal resources she could have chosen to buy anything with it because she's not mandated by any law to do this but it should tell you that it matters who becomes your leader it matters what the intentions of people are and so if this is how she's using her personal resources you can as well guess how she would even use access to resources that does not belong to her. And I think that I salute her wherever she is. We are so proud of her. And I want to encourage her to keep doing more. Now back to the discussion on the table. I think that if there is one thing Parliament is noted for, it's consensus building. And what this impasse should show us is that much as I'm even a lawyer, law does not settle every dispute. In fact, law has traveled so much so that today, emphasis is placed on alternative dispute resolutions. What's your point with this? My point is this is that you can win in the court and still not have what you want. I listened to the Chief Justice when she gave the ruling that the plaintiff action succeed. And then she, and then she said that, the decision will be available in the registry of the court. Yesterday, I saw GH1 reporting that that decision was still not ready. I want to read the dissenting opinion of Justice Tanko and Lovelace. I want to read because for me, that dissenting opinion represents the conscience of what many people believe the decision should be. The Supreme Court is not supreme to the Constitution. They cannot assume jurisdiction where the Constitution does not give them. But you know the funny thing? Now there is a Supreme Court decision. What the Supreme Court could not do and cannot do is to compel the Speaker of Parliament to convey a certain of the House. And so if truly the aim was to get Parliament to do business, is Parliament doing business? There is a vast difference between knowledge and wisdom. Sometimes, how you apply knowledge is more important than the knowledge acquired. Mean and, I think, and I think that we've just gone and come back to square one. So where is government business now? But you are a lawyer. You know that the outcome of that Supreme Court judgment or ruling it's, it's a finality. Yes. Nobody, and they're, and they're, and they're nobody not, says that. And joined by the constitution to do that. Yes. So nobody is saying so that. So the NPC, uh, they're they compelled done? to go. What, 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 what have we done? Because who, the way you are talking. <laughs> who, who is compelling us to go away? 
who is compelling us? There is no law that compels the NDC to go back to parliament because a Supreme Court has given its decision. Just like the Supreme Court did not order the speaker, the Supreme Court did not issue a mandamus compelling the speaker of parliament to reconvene the house. At least the, 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 the chief justice could only agitate and ask, why is parliament not sitting? Otherwise, there was nothing she could do. She could only ask that question. I think that what this should teach us in our democracy is that you can use consensus you can use alternative means to resolve disputes. And that when you compel an arm of government to do something which is contrary to what everybody knows, at the end of the day, you come back to zero. Now I've heard some of the MPP people say they want consensus and they think we should sit and talk. What happened to that line of reasoning before they went to the Supreme Court? What happened to it? I think we will be doing ourselves a disservice to be pretended. Nothing has happened. Afenyo Markin has demonstrated that he has no administrative capacity to be the leader of the MPP parliamentary you, 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 you cannot make those remarks against well, Afenyo Markin. Why can't I make Afenyo Markin is a man of his own. He's had yes, his own but, achievements but what, so in life. I said that and he, he's been chosen he has, to lead the caucus I have no doubt about that. He's deemed to be competent. I, I have no doubt about that. That he's the leader of the caucus. He may be a competent leader in their caucus but he has shown that he does not have the requisite administrative capacity to lead a house on the basis of consensus building when Osei Chairman Sabunsu was the majority leader they had even more pressing issues than this to the extent that even we staged a walkout at the time of passing eleven, you didn't see this so what do you think that Osei Chemensa was doing? He, he was exercising leadership. People may not agree with him, but he got the results. What you have. Did you see Afenyo Markin practically ambushing a reporter of CTFM and saying that, address me by the title. Well, that's I, what he said. He, I said, said he is more His obsessed. position has always been that he's yes, the majority he's leader. More so more obsessed we report by his position. Now he says that the reason is spiritually when he sits in the seat of the minority something spiritual will happen i don't know because maybe he's a freemason he believes in the spiritual world and all that but how do you reduce governance to your personal spirituality and that is where we are so let's not be surprised nothing has been solved and it is in tandem with the mpp's inability to solve every issue from economy to health to agree to any sector and I mean, why do we even have to? Let's go to our second topic. I, I think that that is a more important topic to discuss. Uh, <laughs> Latrice, what do you make of this? Especially even the register were told that your party, for example, was raising concern that there was no segregation. Uh, yeah, there was I, whole numbers that were given, etc. I think that Madame Jane Mensa wants a third term for the NPP, even more than Baumia wants. Well, how do you make those conclusions, Beatrice Annan? And, and so allow me to establish that. You see, by her conduct, she has shown that she's more than the annex of the NPP. Jane Mensah is not the only electoral commissioner we have had in Ghana. We've had and conducted elections from 1992. And much as political parties have had issues in the past, I think that she exercises the powers given to the commission in the most arbitrary manner, in flagrant breach of Article 296, where if a person has the duty to exercise a discretionary power, he ought to exercise that in a fair reasonable and candid manner. What has the EC done that you claim is you. not reasonable, it's unfair, it's unfair? From 1992, every time we have conducted an election, there has been a final figure that the political parties agree to that this is the figure. So that even if there has to be a dispute, we dispute a particular figure or results what you have is that the first time she conducted an election she changed the results almost five times even before you could authenticate release one you have release two come in you raise issues about release two even you say oh 
disregard release too we are now bringing so she does not even have the credibility when it comes to finalizing an election results now there is a rationale behind why people must observe an election it is not for the fun of it that the EC will decide that in my discretion or this morning when I woke up, I think that these people must observe and these people must not observe. There is a rationale. The policy is that we must be able to subject the electoral process to some credibility because the EC is noted for not speaking the truth. When it comes to issues that happen on election day, you remember the Ayawaso West Wagon. When they appeared before the commission, they feign ignorance about things that occurred during the election because their justification was that they did not get the reports from either their officers on the ground or she possibly could not have known. So what an election observing does is to bring to fore which places are starting very early because when the ndc raise their concerns they will say oh it's mp ndc raising then quickly mpp will say oh we disagree with the ndc and then it is politicized but what the election observer does is that because they are neither ndc or mpp they give you a fair and accurate account of what happens so that even in her own interest if she's interested in conducting a very free and fair election she will quickly move in to conduct or to correct some of the anomalies for instance this is a person who could not conduct a district assembly election when the day of the election came they told us oh for some reasons we cannot conduct you can imagine that people were not aware they will tell you they will find a reason for you but for the observation so it is not subject to her whims and caprice and you know the ec in recent times have been using some very flimsy excuses when we raise issue they will say oh it is not the law madame j Manson should know that it is also not the law that she should be given over 10 military men to be protecting her including taking her to salons it is not the law but she has it and so if the law well, were someone who says she's an officer of the state so ah so military all officers of the states have access to military men who are stationed in their houses hold their back some of the military men who went through all these views have become bag holders follow her to saloons and things that is what officers of the state are entitled to please let's get serious the level of public discourse and governance should not be reduced so low because the MPP has introduced a new law. So she should not be deceived by that military protection she has. That she can sit in the comfort of her office, cause mayhem, do things which she is not allowed to do, and then run under the guise of the commissioner's independence. But I want to send a note of caution to those MPP apparatchiks and appendages at the Electoral Commission that they can but only do what are within their limits of the law and the ndc will resist any attempt to subvert the will of the people and the constitution and to the many ndc people i wish i could find my camera and speak to them to the many ndc people and to the many Ghanaians who hope and they are expectant of the fact that power will change so that the draconian hardship that people have been subjected with they will have some form of liberation you have a duty to protect the ballot paper the law mandates all of us to be observers and so when you go to your polling station on 7 december to vote do not leave the polling station this is where the 24 hour economy will start when you get tired I call think you your don't decide who come. stays at the electoral commission polling station or not the it's law, a designated the site law of the EC. does not prohibit us from being within where the ec is not operating because you know why let me complete my statement and i'll address your concern be there nobody can ask you to go home as long as you are not doing anything illegal and you must be there in your numbers you know why you should be there in your numbers for two things first 
so that the people that they have stationed to come and do the ballot staffing, which they did in 2020, and which is their best bet and their source of confidence in this 2024 election, they cannot ballot staff. Because they did that in Asin North. In Asin North, when we formed a human war at the electoral or the polling stations, I personally had a gentleman speak Ga because it was in Asin North. He assumed nobody could speak Ga. Calling someone on the phone that with the number of people here, I cannot do what you say I should do. He, he said that I in report Ga? Yes, because I'm Ga, I speak Ga. So I reported the gentleman to the police officer and they made sure he never came close. He was even scared. And so the EC and the MPP, they only have one agenda to rig this election. But your vigilance, in Asin North, we saw electoral officers tearing two ballot papers to be given to identifiable party people. It took the vigilance of the NDC to stop it. And I am very confident that people are angry. More than ever, we are vigilant. You see how we have put a lot of pressure by, from auditing of the voter register, from detecting wrong transfers and ballot, I mean, the bloating in the register and all that we have a system that we are using but we call on all Ghanaians to be vigilant to resist this rigging because if the npp wants to get 12 years in power if madame jemensa is so interested in giving the npp a third term their works must show there are evidences when the fundamentals are strong, the people will give you another term. You cannot have a dollar of 17 cities to, uh, uh, to a dollar and say that you want a third term. Why? Not through the will of the people. And they, they, when you meet them, they just come back to tell you. Say you are talking about. It's the voters who will decide some of it. Yes. They, 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 so they make when, the decision yes, at, the voters at the will polling decide. station. The voters will decide. And so any attempt to subvert the decision of the voters must be resisted. If the EC had nothing to hide, okay. why? Why would the EC say that oh, no, we should not observe? Didn't create any problem. Uh, Beatrice, just a minute. What, what will be your clarion call on the EC then in relation to this very subject? Just a minute. I, I will not make any clarion call on the EC because they've demonstrated over the period that they are just interested in the MPP and nothing more. The clarion call I want to make is to the Ghanaian people that the EC cannot decide for you who your leaders are. The EC is only to facilitate your decision. And the Constitution mandates all of us to protect and preserve the Constitution. And civil disobedience is no crime. And so if the EC wants to hide under very omnibus and vague and verbose reasons by just saying that we, we can't do this, we will not do this, we are not mandated, you and I have a duty in our various polling stations to stand up to the EC and the electoral officers, most of which they even recruited some known MPP faces. <laughs> You have a duty to make sure that the electoral processes are respected. You have a duty to police the ballot. Nobody can do anything to you. We have a duty to resist the oppressor's rule. And if that oppressor includes the EC, then we will resist the rule. But like I, told, like I said, the MPP came to us in North. Believing that because of their rigging strategies they had put in place, they were going to win the Asin North election. I was in Asin North for the 21 days, never came home. In fact, they even brought caterers. Their level of confidence was that they even brought caterers so that on the night of the declaration, they will hold the party. By 8 p.m., the caterers had packed and they were going to Accra or wherever they came from. And we saw it, we made fun of them. Their only levels of confidence is not their track record. It's not because they have built a hospital for you. It's not because they have provided jobs. It's not because they have constructed the roads. Their confidence is that the EC will aid them to do that which will subvert the will of the well, people. It's categorical. And the you, MPP said you, they are not in aid with, with, the, with, with the EC. Ah, didn't the MPP say that before they appointed their party communicators onto the commission? 
how do you separate a party communicator from an election? So let me conclude and say that wherever you are watching me, the MPP does not to be in power, does not deserve to be in power for 12 years. They have not shown why they have to be in power for 12 years. They cannot use eight years to destroy the nation and tell you that in the coming election, Baumia has a certain magic wand. In any case, maybe the EC is learning from Baumia. If they solve all the problems today, if they allow all, if they allow all the observers today, who will they allow tomorrow? Uh, that is the new.